loss, but from that loss, they have the opportunity to make more sense out of their life. And so that was huge for me. I believed it strongly. It gave me permission that I didn't have to make sense out of why someone died or why there was a loss. But from there, I have the opportunity to expand my life to different levels. So my Thai gives me that gift to expand so that I have more winds that push my sails and move my boat forward. Cool? Mm -hmm. So we'll jump into Kubler-Ross a little bit because she's so cool. Um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is known for the five stages of grief. And actually there were 11. And so over time, she's been known for this. She wouldn't quite agree with it. First of all, it's not stages, so it'd be more phases. And one of the reasons stages doesn't work is then as a good human, we want to check off the boxes. Instead, it's more like I think of as an omelet. So we break the eggs, and I know there's more than five up there. So we break all seven, we stir it into a bowl, and we reach into the hull of our boat, we put in that chorizo, some green chili, some jalapenos, some cheese, whatever else you want to put in there, and we make this omelet. So we can be nibbling on any of these at any time, as well as historical stuff. Now I might bite right into that jalapeno and know exactly where I am, and other times I might be in all of them at the same time. I can be in denial and acceptance at the same time. Please remember, acceptance is the acknowledgement of a fact. It does not mean everything's great and awesome. It's the acknowledgement of a fact. So I can be in those two different spaces at the exact same time. So tonight we're just going to go over these quickly, and then over the next five weeks we'll be breaking them down with Barb and with Ashley. I think you're here, right? And I think Annette. So and then all of you that choose to be here. Um, they're choosing as well. So, um, but tonight, I still only can speak linearly. I have not learned how to speak holographically. If I could, we'd need a really big stadium. <laughs> that would be really fun. But, so please remember, we're moving in and out and all around within these, even though I'm speaking in a linear form, because that's how our brains work with our vocabulary. So denial... Um, can I walk towards you? Is that okay? I promise I'm not going to hurt you in any way. Okay. So denial, first of all, oh, I wanted to say one thing just because I think it's pretty cool. I've become pretty good friends with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's son. And so if her regret was that she called them stages and not phases, I was like, I'm going to get the inside story. I'm going to be the cool dude. And so I said, Ken, you know, just tell me. So if she regretted that she called them stages and, and wanted to call them phases, why did she call them stages? And I was ready to hear this whole profound, deep answer. And he looked at me and goes, because she didn't know much English. So that's, that's the whole reason why she knew German. Um, so, so that, but I just, you know, that's, we try to make things a lot more difficult than they really are. Grief is pretty simple and we let it be natural. But I found these words very difficult. Denial to me meant lying. Anger was, I thought, was an, a behavior. I didn't even know it was an emotion. It meant I'd either get beat up, killed, or in trouble. Bargaining, I thought, was some sort of gambling. Depression is something you did not do. And acceptance, screw you. There's no way I can accept what's just happened in my world. And the other two I added, so I can't get upset with those two. <laughs> um, so those words didn't work for me. And it actually scared me. Grief sounded like a horrendous thing. So I came up with my own words, and you might choose to do the same thing. So for me, denial, I've changed into insulation. So when we have this loss, here I am, and I have this loss. It is so painful, I'm going to retract from that loss. Because it hurts. Naturally, we retract. And that buys me time, buys me insulation, to integrate this loss into my life. Ooh, too hot. And so I do an ebb and flow, back and forth, as I slowly 
over time, integrate this piece into my life. And it still means later on, it doesn't mean some days, whoop, too hot. And so it buys me that time for what I know here can start to have congruence with my emotional world. So it's an ebb and flow, back and forth. So denial is not a bad thing. It actually saves our life so we don't implode or explode. I ended up all the way in Australia, but I did stay on this earth. That's how far away from Taos, New Mexico I had to go. And then I slowly inched my way into this room tonight. So denial is that piece. And that's a big piece that we'll talk about. It's a natural piece. It's actually what allows us enough to move forward. I can't believe this all the way to the fugue state to later on memories. I could go skiing tomorrow, so I have to do some work up there, and I could do a run. I could be like, oh, I can't wait to go tell Leslie. I'm gonna... Oh, she died in 96. And I still wanted to go call her. That's sad. Ah, oh, thank God she gave me enough knowledge to be here today. I'm glad she's the keel on my boat that Marcel and I get to play on. So I can do a whole grief process and something can happen. Anger, I truly thought, was only a behavior. I had no clue it was an emotion. None. Because growing up back in the days when we grew up, as a little white boy, you didn't get angry because you might get stabbed. Or if you're at home, you still get beat up. Or you're at school and you get in trouble. So I didn't even know it was an emotion. Anger is a protest. This sucks. This is not what I wanted. This was not my plan. I'm not going to roll on the floor, but that's for you, Richie. So, it's just the protest. And it's a really important piece, because naturally, we would be releasing those cells that are locking in. But we have been told to cut it out. Behave. So at age two, I'm sure this happened, I don't remember it going down the grocery store and I want that bubble gum and mom says no and I go, she said, cut it out or you're going to get a whipping. <laughs> and I go, <laughs> if I was more evolved, I would look up at my mother and say, mom, I am doing my somatic work so that we don't have to have therapy together when I'm 40. <laughs> but I don't, so I learn and I domesticate it into me. But I lock it in, I lock it in, and I lock it in. So in there, what we really want is ways to say, I protest. This is not what I want. And that fits in with vicarious grief. Watching so many of my friends, through my process, I had vicarious grief for them, seeing how much vicarious grief they had for me. Watching my pain that they couldn't take away, and actually I'm glad they couldn't take it away. The protest is just in there. Bargaining is the shoulda, coulda, woulda. I wish I'd done this, if I could only done this, if I'd only done that, if I hadn't been smoking pot when I was in sixth grade, then, my, then Leslie wouldn't have had a miscarriage later on, and that biologically doesn't even make sense. But we do these pieces, we're trying to change the story. So I see it, if that clock was my loss, I'm the director of my own movie, I don't like that feeling, cut, let's put this in, cut, let's put this in, ouch, come on. And what I'm doing is I'm slowly chiseling at denial as I try to change the story. And the stories can be intense and crazy, and it's okay. They don't have to make sense, and you're not insane. They're just crazy stories. Now, in with that emotional regression, this is a really important piece for me because this almost cost me my life. When the world doesn't make sense out here, and magical thinking from that young age, it means it's my fault. So I was coaching the Taos Tigers in Albuquerque when my daughters and mother-in-law were in the car crash. So in that process, that's a dad's only job protect his children. I didn't protect my children. I'm a murderer. And I can't tell anyone that because they'll say I'm crazy and say, uh-uh. So I must be really sick. And this is where we start going into that isolation piece. 
So knowing we have these pieces and finding healthy people where they can be processed, not even, uh -uh, or, oh, that's a tricky thought, then can lead, because then I didn't think I was deserving to have a life. I deserve to be in prison. So that led to a lot of different decisions in that place unconsciously. So we can get caught in that piece. Bargaining is just trying to come up with a story that makes sense. Bargaining is also, how do I start to choose to heal again? I have to claim my victim position, my victimized position. I have a loss. And in that, I can empower myself to start to heal. So we're bargaining and coming here tonight. I'm choosing to come to grief with you. The bargaining is that process of trying to connect dots that just aren't making sense and become some story. It's also my last fight for control. I'm the director of my own movie. Now remember, we move back and forth and all around, so then I get mad. I'm the director and it's not going the way I want. And then that's too noisy, so I move into denial. And maybe I move into addictive tendencies, so we're going to go get drunk, we're going to go get in a fight. Mary, you and I are going to go do something. And then who knows what we're going to do. And so we're gonna, I'm going to start finding ways of doing this stuff. So we move back and forth and all around. In there, I slowly get exhausted, and I move down to, excuse me, into depression. Depression in loss is situational depression. Now, people probably 45 and up heard enough ads that said depression is bad, so you're supposed to take this pill. I'm not pro or con on meds. I think that's a very individual decision and process. But the ad said that. They have the little girl out on the swing set while the mom's like this, and then they even have the dog that would go, oh. Okay, so they. But now those patents are gone, so we don't have those ads anymore. Depression just means I drop. I can't keep fighting for the way it used to be. Denial's not holding up. Bargaining's not holding up. And so I drop. I'm sad. I surrender. As a therapist, this is really important. I get to get excited, and luckily the person can't hear my brain, because I'm going, yes. Because what have they done? I'm sad because I have a loss. And so in that, they've moved to levels of acceptance. And the first time I heard acceptance, I thought that was a really bad word. And how dare you say I have to accept these things happen? It means it's the acknowledgement of a fact. It doesn't mean it's good, bad, or in between. It's just the acknowledgement this has happened. Now, Kubler-Ross's work, that was the end because she was looking at the dying process, what she found out is the bereft, the beloved, did the same process in order to birth themselves into the next piece of their life. In other words, redefine themselves. So that was all pretty cool. I read her books and did all that sort of thing. Then when I was out working on the chapel with the boys out at Golden Willow, I had the wheelbarrow. If you have 10, 12-year-olds build a chapel, you have a big mess once they leave. So I was cleaning it all up, and uh, I was like, something's missing. Something's missing. I can't figure it out. Well, just like my boat, I'm not that creative. So I called it the unknown because I couldn't figure it out. That's the piece of grace, spirituality, forgiveness, uh, self-realization connection. It's the piece that I don't think we can force on anyone. If I come up to Ashley and say, Ashley, you have to forgive. Well, she's probably going to kick me. That's including if Ashley's going, Ashley, you have to forgive. There's a defiant piece that pops up. These happen through the grief process. 99.99% .99 of the time, I have complete forgiveness for my mother-in-law who ran a stop sign that killed her and my children. I leave that point zero zero one because someday I'll go through that intersection when I'm going out to do my radio show and I'm going to have a piece that bubbles up. I can't remember the last time that was there. At the, when that all happened, I had her as a horrendous murderer if she could even enter my psyche. 
Today, she's an awesome person who I miss who made a terrible mistake. And so, if anyone and people did said, I have to forgive, it actually slowed down the process because then I wanted to defend it. So the unknown is where that area lives. I think it happens through the journey of grief. Relocation that's come up in a lot of different research in different ways um, is really how do we now step back into the world? How do we move from the concrete loss and move that relationship into the abstract? From this concrete place, from the physical to the metaphysical. I promise you, every day I'm in a relationship with Carrie and Amy, Leslie and Richard. I ask for their help all the time. Leslie watches over this room with Carrie on her first birthday in that picture right above on that wall. So from them, I can glean their essence to help me today. Now, it doesn't mean there's not days always that I wish they were here, but we start to move that relationship. The scary part is at the beginning, if I let go of this, I might not have anything. So we flirt with the idea. We move it over. I asked your wife to help me in the last workshop we did by being in the chapel. I was in that corner. So even there, I'm asking, hey, guys bring your essence to help me bring those deer in and so we have these different parts that relocation can happen i don't see auras i don't see phenomena i don't see colors i'm not teasing i wish i did but for me it'd make it a lot easier but i know they're still in relationship with me one of the best compliments i received in a grief group like this was someone who had come off and on forever for about 16 years and she goes you know Ted one of the greatest things to watch is how your relationship continues to grow with Carrie and Amy and so in that there's something still there now there I've talked about the death of loved ones there can be pieces in our life that aren't that we don't want to bring forward let's say we've been sexually molested we've been raped or abused there we want to glean the wisdom and leave the rest behind. It doesn't mean we have to come kumbaya with every single thing that's happened in our life. But we can glean that wisdom and then walk the circle a little better. So however this relocation comes out, and it comes out in so many ways. For me, it came out as Golden Oil Retreat, Golden Oil Counseling, and what I do. There was a good chance that almost happened where I was just going to stay in Maui and I was going to make pizzas, but I was going to put so much love in that pizza that I hoped that love would go over to you. But then I realized I'd have to sell pot because I couldn't afford to live in Hawaii. <laughs> and then I'd go to jail and then I didn't really want to do that. So it went a different direction. So, so we, we replay out those pieces. But in that, I'm gleaning the wisdom to help me today. And we move back and forth all around. So anytime we start to reach out, that's awesome. Whew, that's close. That's two minutes after. <laughs> um, so that is the process that you guys will be playing with over the next six weeks, or keep coming whenever you choose, and the different phases. Um, and also, please know there's no agenda. The facilitator, the group, no one's trying to get you to a different place. For one person, spirituality and God might not mean a thing. For another, it might be what's held them through the whole entire process. So in those parts, we get to learn from one another and see how they're coming. And know that each person has their own place, but we all share a similar theme called emotional healing from a loss. So any burning questions or thoughts?